argued about for a long while. You still think you were right? Yes, I think I was right. I always had the opinion that in an emergency, and that undoubtedly was an emergency, uh, the president has the right not only to exercise the powers delegated to him in the Constitution, but all those that are not prohibited to him by the Constitution. And I followed that procedure, as has the president, as have the presidents before me, from Jef Jefferson on down. Uh, a voting campaign is essential when a fellow is, has a strong and powerful opposition. I might tell you a story about the Chinaman's Chance, incidentally, while they were there, while we were there. I didn't want to insult the Chinaman because I have a great respect for the Chinese people. We were coming back from Rio de Janeiro and crossed the equator. And of course, Neptune initiated a great many of the people. And we had a little Chinese reporter on the ship. You know, he wouldn't weigh 130 pounds with all his clothes on. And they ran in through the Neptune ceremony, and when he came out, I, I said, Lou, how'd you come out? Well, I said, Mr. Truman, you know how, I said, Mr. President, you know how I came out. I didn't have a Chinaman's chance. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that uh, there has been, in the course of your term in public life, very much distortion in the reporting by newspapers? Radio and television, let's put them all together. I don't think there's been an intentional distortion. But to as many, see as many as you can and always tell them the facts as you see them. And if they, uh, people like a man who's honest, whether they agree with him or not, and if they know he's expressing his honest opinion, they're much more likely to be with him, even if they don't entirely agree with what he's trying to pull over. What, in your experience, was the most difficult program or policy that you had to, in the vernacular, sell to the American people? Well, the most difficult uh, thing I had to sell to the American people in the campaign of 1948 was to overcome the misrepresentations and distortions that had been made of various actions of mine with regard to the decisions I'd had to make while I was president of the United States in, uh, previous to that, from 1945 to 1948. And uh, all I had to do was to state my case, just as I've tried to state it in the memoirs. Those memoirs may not be considered by future historians as uh, the history of the period, but they're my viewpoint of what happened. And they explain the reasons of why I did the various things as President of the United States. And that's what I tried to do in the 1948 campaign. Were you ever tempted to run again in 52? No, I had made up my mind long before that that uh, I had done everything I possibly could as President of the United States, that my age had reached a point where I would be uh, uh, pretty well along at the end of a third term. And I considered that I'd had two terms, and I've always been a two-term man, although I think it was necessary for Roosevelt to be re-elected the number of times that he was when, on account of the emergencies that came up. But I've always believed in the two-term proposition, but I never believed in the Constitution amendment to establish it, because you never can know when an emergency is coming along. I see the present occupant of the White House is complaining about it right now. You wouldn't have taken uh, um, a draft in 1952 had there been a deadlock, or did you ever think of that? Yes, I thought about it. I would not. I would not. Speaking of the present occupant of the White House, uh, you recount that on one occasion, when he had decided not to run, you said to him in substance, uh, this is a wise decision because your reputation and your stature, like Grant's, can only go down if you do. You still feel you gave him wise counsel? I gave him wise counsel, and he wrote me the best letter on why I know The military training, particularly in the two great academies and now in the Air Force, has something to do with limiting division. There's no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it. The civilian soldier, is never injured by military training. That's the reason I wanted a universal training program for the young men of this country, because I think it would help their health, their viewpoint, and give them an idea of what they have in the government of the United States. But a professional soldier is a different thing. He's necessary. I believe in professional soldiers, but he ought to stay a professional soldier. I don't think he has any business in politics. But uh, to pursue this a little more, do you feel that the professional soldier even is perhaps ill-trained in areas outside strictly the practice of the military arts. That's my opinion. That's always been my opinion. And I've had a lot of contact with them, and I like them. Some wonderful men. 
in the military, and some of them overcome that handicap, but not all of them. Let's go back to the court again for a moment, Mr. President. Uh, um, in the appointments that you made to the big court, what qualities did you look for? I tried to pick men of common sense with a good legal background and men who would have an open mind when things became, came before them so they could look at it from strictly a judicial viewpoint. I think I was rather successful in that. I suppose the most criticism leveled against you was on the appointment of Tom Clark, wasn't it? Well, yes, but they've criticized me on every appointment. That's customary. They don't criticize the president on an appointment. He hasn't made a good one. At what point did you become rather of a, um, oh, callous against personal criticism? Well, I think the date was about 1926. When was that? I was, run I was running for presiding judge of the county court of Jackson County, and I'd been through two campaigns for uh, a member of that court. And they'd said everything about me that could possibly be said, and I knew there wasn't anything new they could say about me. So I don't care what they say about me politically when I'm in a campaign. If they can't prove it, it doesn't make any difference. But personally, you got a little tender sometimes, don't you, still? Well, there's only one place where I get tender. They better not attack my family unless they want to have a fist fight. This is an old-fashioned custom in Missouri, isn't it? In, in, in any state that produces uh, fighting men, like Tennessee and Virginia and Kentucky and North Carolina, and uh, in some of the uh, states that are a little far north of, of the Mason and Dixon line, you find men that are willing to stand up and fight for their families and their beliefs. And that's a good American custom. That's great for luck. <laughs> I think this is a fine point on which to break. <laughs> it may be useful in our system to have an informal coalition government? Well, I don't think the coalition government can be organized here. We can have a bipartisan arrangement so that uh, uh, two parties are in agreement with what happens. But the President of the United States is the chief executive and the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and he is the government in an, an, in a, an emergency of that sort along with uh, certain acts which the Congress has to pass, and which they always do without hesitation. That's like this, and Mr. Prime Minister, why don't you agree? We and the Americans have agreed, and you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what, what about General de Gaulle? General de Gaulle was hard, uh, a hard person to talk to. I, I didn't have uh, but one contact with him. He came over to see me uh, from France while he was uh, provisional president of France. And we discussed a great many matters, but he had a very hard time making up his mind. And I never was right sure that he intended to keep the agreement after he made it up, because I had to uh, force him to get out of Italy with the French troops, if you remember. Were you compelled by events, or was this a deliberate decision on your part? It was a deliberate decision on my part, and the events helped the decision tremendously. We completely reversed the isolationist po uh, policy of the United States and gave the United States a foreign policy which put us at the head of the free nations of the world, made us the leaders of the free world. And it's necessary for us to maintain that leadership if we expect to keep peace in the world because we are the most powerful free nation that the world has ever seen. In fact, I think we're the most powerful nation in the world. We ought to stay that way. Well, now, uh, were these decisions worry at this time? And if we can keep that worry going, it'll help to meet, bring peace in the world. Do you see some ultimate possibility of our recognizing Communist China? I am not in a position to make a statement on the subject because it's a very touching one. We had in the long run to recognize Communist Russia, and I don't know whether that's a historical precedent or not. We'll have to wait and see how things develop. And it depends altogether on the development in world affairs and the attitude which the Chinese take toward peace. What is your view of the strategic importance of Formosa? Well, the strategic importance of Formosa uh, uh, fits in with a defensive line beginning with the northern border of Japan, Formosa, the Philippine Islands, and the southwest Pacific, or yeah, the southeast Pacific. Do you um, have any concern at all lest we have overextended ourselves and made commitments around the world that we may not be able to discharge? No, I don't think we're overextended at all if we use good judgment and keep our friends. We're overextended if we lose the friends we have in the free world. Well, you've already answered.
answer the next question I wanted to ask you, which is what is the most urgent thing confronting this country today? Keep up the friendships with our friends in World War uh, II and maintain the NATO organization on a going, as a going concern. How do you view the future of NATO, Mr. President? I think it's absol an absolute necessity. I think it's just as necessary now as it was when it was uh, signed, when the treaty was signed. And I think we've got to keep our friends, who've been our friends all the time, particularly France and Great Britain. Do you see any real possibilities of achieving a workable system of disarmament? Well, the only workable system of disarmament is to be sure that Russia disarms at the same time we do and in the same proportion. Unless that's done, we won't have any disarmament. And you don't believe that that is, uh, shall we say, imminent? I don't see anything to indicate that it is. Of course, I'm not in, in a position now uh, to give you definite statements on that because I don't have any central intelligence agency. I have to get my information from the newspapers, and as you know, sometimes I don't rely on that entirely. I have heard rumors to that effect. Mr. President, it is true, isn't it, that historically we have in this country suffered from a sort of dual personality in regard to colonialism. That we have on the one hand been disposed to support Britain and France, and on the other hand our history and tradition and mythology demand that we support any people who want to be free. Well, yes, that's to a certain extent true. Our alliances with Britain and France were brought about by the First and Second World Wars, and we are interested in saving those three countries from becoming totalitarian, both in the First World War and in the Second World War. And in the Second World War, uh, President Roosevelt carried on negotiations with France and Britain and Holland on the elimination of uh, uh, giving free, uh, urging them to give free government to their great colonies, and to a great extent that's been accomplished. You didn't exactly follow Mr. Roosevelt's general attitude toward the Arab states, did you, Mr. President? In what way? Well, wouldn't he, wouldn't he be regarded as having been a little more friendly to the Arab states than you were during your administration? I don't see how he could have been. One of the best friends we had while I was president of the United States was the King of Arabia. Even so, then the King of Jordan was also our friend. The Prime Minister of Lebanon was our friend. The Prime Minister of Syria was our friend. Three of those men were assassinated for the very reason that they were friendly to us. I had no trouble with the Arabs at all. Do you see any long-range possibility of an agreement between Israel and her Arab neighbors now? I think eventually it can be reached. In fact, it has to be reached because Israel is there to stay. Will it come about, do you think, through negotiation or normal economic pressure in a division of water? In I think the economic uh, negotiation is the approach that will have to be made to it. As I told you yesterday, the proper development of uh, a great many of the Arab states and an, uh, an industrial setup for Israel and one or two other of the states in eastern Mediterranean will solve the problem, in my opinion, although I'm uh, an optimist, as you know. Mr. President, uh, let's go back to politics for a moment. Fire away. Uh, I think you once are reported to have said to General Eisenhower when he was considering running that uh, if he did, that there was only one way his stature and reputation could go, and that was down. Yes, I said that to him because uh, he was uh, in a position uh, almost up on a pedestal. When a man gets in, uh, into politics, no matter where he starts, at the bottom of the top, He's no longer on a pedestal. If he is, they'll topple him off if they have an opportunity. So you think you gave him sound advice? I'm sure I did. Uh, I was thinking of General Grant at the time. Yes, sir. Um, what advice would you give to aspiring young politicians in this country? I think every young man and young woman in this country ought to have all the interest he can possibly have in politics. Politics is government. And government in our country, as the Constitution says, is lodged in the people in the free people. And if they're not interested in their own political setup, we lose that freedom. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to urge them to take an interest in politics. And must take an interest in their local affairs, in their ward affairs, in their county affairs, in their state affairs, as well as national. And they ought to inform themselves so they can vote intelligently and then the country safe. Why is it that more people of ability don't choose to enter politics? Thin skin. They're afraid somebody will throw a brick at them and they won't be able to catch it. It'll hit them. You think that's the primary reason? That's the primary reason. They don't like to be uh, 
in a rough and tumble verbal fight. They're afraid that there, uh, something will come out that may cause them any injury or hurt their business or something of the kind. But there are an immense number of people who are not afraid and who do take a hand in politics and who are willing to take it on the chin when the going gets rough. What about our method of selecting the president? the whole matter of state primaries and conventions and so forth. Isn't there a better way of doing it? Well, it's never been arrived at yet. Every effort has been made to improve it. I think there have been some long hearings in the Senate and some wonderfully intelligent reports on the subject. But a practical way to meet the situation has not yet been found. You don't think a direct primary would do it? No, I don't. I don't think a direct prim primary is possible for the simple reason that there's no political organization or no man in this country who's rich enough to carry on two elections, and that's what it would amount to. Well, speaking of finances, as it becomes more and more expensive to conduct a campaign as a result of the cost of radio and television and so forth, aren't we likely to reach a point where uh, the party with the biggest pocketbook uh, will win? We reach that point right now. But the proper uh, uh, solution for that Here's a suggestion that was made in the United States Senate, I think, by Carl Hatch when he was United States Senator from Mexi New Mexico, that the proper thing to do was for the federal government to finance the campaigns of both parties and give them an equal chance and then allow no private financing in the thing. And That's that one solution. Would you favor that? I think it's got merit. I would have to study it a great deal, but it's never been worked out to its final conclusion. But some means must be found uh, to prevent uh, what virtually amounts to the buying of an election. Although all my experiences as uh, can have a new influence, the, the tendency to have campaigns taken over by advertising agencies. Well, it's just like selling soap, and it's not right. It doesn't work. People uh, usually understand what those people are talking about, and they don't fool anybody but themselves. They wait as Republicans are a special interest party. They always have been. They follow Alexander Hamilton. They think there are certain people in the country who are better qualified to rule than the ordinary run of the people. The idea of Jefferson and Jackson and Abraham Lincoln and Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt has been that every citizen of the United States is capable of doing something and knowing something about his government and that the welfare of the country ought to be such that every man, as a citizen, attains his rights and has a chance to do whatever he's able to do and do it well. Uh, and the Republicans think that there ought to be a ruling class. They're somewhat like the Bourbons when you come right down to it. Projecting the main areas of political conflict. Well, of course, uh, the, it's hard to prophesy a thing of that kind because you don't know what the developments will be. I think that, uh, of course, uh, domestic affairs will be fundamentally and basically uh, a matter of controversy between the two parties, because the Republicans will still continue to try to get the special interest to control the country, and the Democrats will still try to keep the common people in control. And then the greatest thing with which we're faced, I think, is a continuation of a bipartisan policy of far on the foreign policy for the simple reason that there's uh, when the parties get to bickering over foreign policy, it destroys the efforts to negotiate with other countries. And I was it's carried on in the world, and it's a, uh, it'll be a magnificent thing if we don't use it to destroy ourselves with. I don't think that we're going to do that. I think we've got too much sense to do that. But when the atomic energy age comes, it'll be uh, to this to this age what this age was to the coal oil light and the sailing ship. Mr. President, uh, there is always a problem as to how much information the government should release, how much it should make public. Have you formed any conclusions on this as to what the guidelines should be? Well, no, it's almost impossible to do that. Of course, when uh, the uh, head of the state, the President of the United States, is negotiating on foreign policy with other governments. He can't do it in the newspapers. 
any more than two men can sit down and make a real estate deal with the reporters all around. It just can't be done. The negotiations have to be carried on in a manner to, to a point where an agreement is reached. And then, as soon as that agreement is reached, it ought to be publicly announced, which is always done in the Roosevelt and my administration. I think it's always been done in this administration. But there are certain things that uh, can't be made public because sometimes uh, uh, some head of some foreign state will make a remark that would make everybody in the country want to fight. Well, there's no use releasing that because you know he's not doesn't mean anything. Well, we just try to get a better deal out of the people he's dealing with. That's one of the reasons for the uh, thing. Demagoguery, you know, can cause more trouble than any other thing in the world. And we've had a great many demagogues in this country. Um, do you anticipate that we'll have some more in the future? Well, of course. Of course, we're constituted that way. Every free country has. Uh, do you think radio and television have introduced any substantial changes in the essentials of political campaigning? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think people uh, are a great deal harder to fool now when they can see what people look like on these picture machines and uh, can hear what they have to say and watch them while they're saying it. But personal contact, in my opinion, will never be passed out as the best political asset a man can have. Speaking of demagogues, uh, what's the best way to deal with it? Some laughter in your political career, Mr. President. That's of exceeding importance. If you can get the people laughing at your opponent, without in any way injuring his character. I don't believe in character assassination of any kind. But if you can get the people to think something the other fellow's doing is entirely funny, then you've got him on the run. Do you have the feeling that uh, newspapers influence the vote of the individual very much? Well, they used to have a tremendous influence, but uh, people have begun uh, to make up their minds themselves more than they used to because they have other means of information and they can uh, judge people much better now than they could formerly. In my opinion, I, I've never had any respect for the political influence of the press because 90% of them have always been against me. Let's take five. Well, this is what okay, I think. Okay, start the camera, start the tape. President, would you guess that history will record your major achievements in the domestic or the international field? I haven't any way of knowing. A uh, man that attempts to anticipate what history will say about him when he's making it is in a hell of a fix because he can't tell. <laughs> Difficult enough to understand history without uh, anticipating it, isn't it? Yes, and uh, when I read the, uh, the things that are taken for history now, it gives me some doubt as to whether the facts that I've been led to believe are our history are really true or not. What's wrong with the teaching of history in this country, Mr. President? Well, they make an effort out of it instead of making it something interesting. I think history is a nothing but a, a record of the actions of men. And my, I found my greatest interest in history when I began to read the biographies of the men who made it. And there's also something else in connection with the history as you read it. If you don't uh, know what's going on in other countries, when you're, for instance, if you're studying the history of England from the time of the Roman conquest down, if you don't know what's going on on the continent, that is, in the rest of the Roman Empire and in France and, and uh, Holland and the Scandinavian countries and Germany, at the same time that the situation is developing in England, you can't understand why the English did this and that and what made them great. For instance, one of the most important uh, uh, achievements of Henry VIII was his agreement with France, if you remember. And there's a story about his making a trip to France to see King Louis XII. Well, uh, his sister, Mary Tudor, was married to Louis XII. Of an off, Louis XII died, if you remember. Mary Tudor married Brandon. And uh, the thing that uh, struck me uh, with Henry VIII was when she got married, he said, my God, she took her hair down. That <laughs> meant she was a virgin. <laughs> Do you remember the first biography that really interested you, Mr. Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, the, there was a whole uh, set of 
Abbott's Lives of Great Men in the Independence Library, and my mother bought me a four-volume set, great big volumes, uh, all, each one of them almost as big as a telephone book, called Great Men and Famous Women. Well, I took those from the beginning and read them all the way through, and uh, they, had, they were divided into, in these Great Men and Famous Women volumes, they were divided into uh, soldiers and sailors, and uh, uh, poets and, and authors, or uh, uh, poets and something, men of prose, anyway, is just one word. And then there were two other volumes that had uh, to do with the civil population, the uh, great men who'd been rulers of the country. And Abbott's lives, you know, uh, are in that same line. It takes Cyrus the Great and people like that, Alexander the Great and Napoleon, and, and uh, uh, all the great military leaders, and it also takes a great many of the great civil leaders. And I just got interested in it, and then found out what those men were doing in the history book that I was studying in school, and that made it interesting. How old were you then, Mr. President? Well, I started that when I was about 10, and kept it up until I got through high school at 17. Were you more interested in uh, the military men or the poets? Yeah. Very much interested in, in the military men. I was particularly interested in the successful heads of states, those uh, rulers who are, had the name great uh, uh, placed after their names, and they usually were military men also, Peter the Great of Russia and uh, uh, King Henry IV of France and the, the, uh, the Alexander the Great. And, Cyrus the Great, they were all the heads of states, but they were also great military men along with it. And our, my favorite general of the whole outfit was Hannibal. And the only information we had on him was what we got from the Romans, whom he licked for 21 years in their own country. It is recorded in history that Hannibal uh, was indefatigable, a tireless man. And it has also been said that he crossed the elephant, he crossed the Alps with elephants without ever getting tired. But there's no reason why he should have, because he was riding. Was <laughs> I suppose so. They tell all sorts of uh, tales about the the great men, um, two thirds of which you can't believe. Uh, Hannibal was undoubtedly a magnificent leader, or he never could have gotten the men to do the impossible things that they did. Napoleon had the same character. He could get men to go in, and they knew they were going to get killed, and they went in and liked it. Alexander had the same facility. And leadership, my definition of leadership is that uh, a leader is a man who can get men to do things that they don't want to do and like it. That's a very good definition. That's my definition of leadership. And you find that it works. Uh, but there are an immense number of great leaders uh, of the world, while all the rest of these men were getting into the history books and being written up. There must have been a magnificent a number of magnificent men army and General Bradley as chief staff to instruct General MacArthur to move uh, as many divisions as he could spare, at least two, to Formosa, uh, to uh, Korea, uh, to stop these people if it were possible. And uh, that action was taken immediately. And we notified all our allies that we expect them to join us in heading off this uh, uh, communist aggression in Korea, which was no doubt backed by the Russians. And that's how the thing was carried out on that night. And it seems that my recollection is collect, uh, correct because I've gone over two or three times with the other members who were there, other members of the staff who were there. Did you make of this expanding into a major war? Yes. Yes, we considered it from every angle. It was talked about all through the dinner at the Blair House. And our main effort was to prevent it from being the cause of uh, another world war. And that was the reason we wanted as many of the members of the United Nations to take, take a hand and become interested in it as possible. And it worked out just that way. We didn't get into a major war, although we keep skated very close to the edge. What about... That was one of the greatest decisions that ever was made. And it was a successful one, and a very costly one, but it was worth what it cost. And there wasn't a bit of sense in the world in stopping halfway. If it were possible to make a more...
powerful explosion than the one of the first atomic bomb. It seemed to me that with all the uh, background and material and all the money that had been spent, it was our duty to go ahead and carry the thing to its logical conclusion, and that was the reason it was done. And this was done, of course, after persistent efforts to reach agreement on control and inspection with the Russians. Oh, yes. Uh, that effort began in 1945, uh, just a short time after the, uh, the uh, uh, Japanese surrendered. One of the first things that I did as president was to appoint a committee to work in cooperation with the United Nations to see if we could not get a complete control internationally of atomic energy. If the world ever gets into turmoil, however, it will be used, you can be sure of that. Do you have the feeling in general, Mr. President, that uh, in the past we have tended to divide our defense dollar rather on the basis of mold and experimenting more with new weapons? I you about an airport in Florida at Jacksonville where the Navy had uh, one side of the fence and the Army had the other and needed to abandon the airfield of the other no matter if they were in trouble. Well, there isn't any sense in that. The Defense Department ought to be a coordinated, organized. I understand that you started thinking about the unification of the armed forces while you were in the Senate. While well, I was chairman of the committee, I, I learned that it was necessary to have complete cooperation among the armed forces themselves if we were going to meet the enemy on a basis to work with. And then uh, it had to wait until you were president so that you could knock heads together to get you to conflict. Well, right? I went to work uh, while uh, I was doing all this uh, thinking and while I was president and got the uh, statements from the commanding generals and admirals all around the world as to their viewpoint on unification of command. And I got complete uh, endorsement of the whole situation. But when the thing came up in the Congress for action, I had to pull some of these statements to offset some of the statements that they made to the committees. But we finally got the thing done. But it's not as well done as it should be. It's not as efficient. Well, I think I don't I don't know exactly wh how to answer that question. Uh, I'm hard to irk. <laughs> I usually get a, I usually get a lot of fun out of people that try to irk me, and they are usually sorry when they're starting to do it. One of the difficulties uh, uh, with the presidency, with, uh, with the uh, situation as it is and can't be helped, is that the president is under wraps all the time. He can't go anywhere or do anything like any other man for the simple reason that he is the president of the greatest republic in the history of the world. And I've always been a free agent. I like to go where I please and do what I damn please when I damn please, and I, I didn't get to do that while I was president. But once work, you stayed for a <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I couldn't do anything about that. Mr. President, do you see any real possibility of any way of lightening this intolerable load? I'm talking now of ceremonial occasions and assigning documents from the president. Well, I've got a lecture which I deliver on that subject, and it's a very difficult thing to do under our constitutional setup. And when you go to dividing authority, one of the great things about our, our governmental organization is that the three branches of government are independent of each other, but the executive branch is under the direction of one man, which makes it a lot easier to handle than it would be if it were divided all around and had a half a dozen men or something. You're talking about that cabinet form of government. That's the difference between our government and theirs. And I don't know how that burden can be lightened. It has been lightened to some extent because a great deal of the uh, signing that used to be assigned to the president has uh, been removed. For instance, he doesn't sign as many commissions, he doesn't sign as many papers as he used to, but he still has to pass on the authority when they are signed, be sure that everything is centered where it ought to be. It's a very difficult thing to work out. I don't know how you reorganize uh, the present setup of the government under our Constitution without going uh, into one with which we're not familiar and which would take us a long time to get into operation. You know, it took us 80 years to get the Constitution to work, and then we had to whip ourselves to do it in the 1860s.
Uh, historically, more changes have been made in terms of major legislation when there is a president in the White House who is determined to lead and, if necessary, to do battle with the Congress. That's correct. Well, uh, the fight with the Congress uh, over in the, uh, uh, the labor and educational legislation of, of the 80th Congress. And I had the uh, biggest time in the world of that and uh, won the election in 1948 fighting the 80th Congress. But the 80th Congress did a good job in foreign affairs. Speaking of the operations of government, Mr. President, what limitations, if any, do you think should be put upon the right to report, not only domestically, but internationally? You mean for... Uh, Reporters. Publication? Yes. Oh, I don't think there's any, any very uh, uh, serious necessity for any regulation on the uh, uh, good reporters. Good reporters have just as uh, strong and patriotic a feeling for the welfare of the country as uh, does any other citizen of the country. And I found it, that if the situation was explained to them and it was told them why certain things at a certain time should not be made public, I never had one to break his, his agreement with me. And I never had to put a hammer on him. Although I think that there are some yellow journals that ought to be suppressed. <laughs> but you wouldn't suppress them if you could, would you? No, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> do, do you have any feeling on the matter of uh, the right to report anywhere in the world? I mean, I'm talking now specifically about uh, the current argument about uh, reporting from China. Well, I, I don't know that the uh, men can be should be restrained if they're willing to take the risk to go and find out what they can see and what they want to report on. I can't see where that would do a bit of harm. And uh, I don't believe it's our business to uh, try to shut 